Okay, we're still uh, dealing with the uh, Christmas infestation of tinsel plants. So you'll have to deal with the mess on my desk. Now, a little while ago, my UPS died. We can put a clip here of exactly how that happened. All right, now's the bit where we start to angry up the electrons. Okay. Now, I have been, in the meantime, running on a 600 VA1 I put into bits and pieces, or built out of bits and pieces, and it's kind of doing the job, but we've got to run all of this junk up here, including like 16 odd cameras and stuff as well. And uh, fiber NTD, this is gonna be replaced soon. There's all the stuff underneath the desk as well. So uh, a 1500 VA is probably more in keeping with what we need. Ideally, I'd run two or three of these, but I'm not rich. Um, now, special thanks to um, the Electronic Barn. I will put a link to them. They gave me a very good discount on this, so I'm going to pitch their website down below. So hopefully uh, you can go and see them if you need some stuff. We're going to do an upgrade to this as well. The upgrade will include a couple of these, which are 9 amp hour gel cells and not the uh, seven and a half amp hour ones that are in here. That should give us just a little bit more runtime in this, um, and uh, hopefully a little bit more current carrying capacity. Now, if I appear to struggle with the weight, it's partly because these things are considerably heavier than a standard um, gel cell of their size, and uh, the tendons in this part of my arm are knackered. Uh, my apprentice, um, I took her to the surf beach recently, and uh, she, uh, nearly tore my arm off when she was getting washed away by a wave. So I have a bit of ligament injury there. Okay, and because of the aforementioned tendon issues, I'm using a uh, portable screwdriver. Now, the magnet that I dropped on the floor last night can be used for holding screws. Now this takes a few screws to get open. We're gonna rip all them out, take the cover off. Then we have, I think, four screws in the bottom here to do as well. They hold the bracket in that holds the batteries on. We'll undo all of those and we'll come back. Now, straight away, I am noticing some differences between boards. This is our blown up one. Let's have a bit of a look here. So uh, this is our old board. And we have an LM317 here and uh, a string of FP5N06s. There are seven of those although this one is isolated so i think um it's a set of six and uh you can see these ones are royally blew their guts out they're actually cracked off the heatsink i've pushed them in there now we have again eight of these which i think is pretty much the same setup we've got two different heat sinks here we have a couple of fuses on board that were not present previously that is an interesting change um the relay layout is a little differently we're not using golden relays anymore, we're using Sayos. It's still a cheap board, but there have been some revisions made. And um, these ones are not available anymore. And I would suggest that uh, perhaps some of the issues I've had with that one may potentially have been addressed in this. First thing I'm gonna do is remove our hot wire, which is on considerably more firmly than I would have expected. These are proper locking lugs. Um, and that one, there we go. This is considerably thicker cable than in the previous version too. Um, although that ground cable is roughly the same. Yeah, anyway, um, four screws, pull batteries out. Now, one of the best ways I've found to get these screws out without these batteries dropping everywhere is to precariously teeter it on the edge of the bench like this and undo the screws from the bottom. Um, that seems to be the more reliable and safer way of doing it. We need to undo these two screws and lift the circuit board rails up as well. This feels very flimsy at this point, but uh, it is what it is. All right, maybe I should just take the circuit board out completely. I think it would be worth doing this properly. We're going to remove the circuit board off and then move these rails. So, um, I have got this free with some plugs unplugged. The easiest way, however, is to simply um, rip the circuit board out. I noticed they've gone for a longer plug here and they've chopped a pin out. Um, and that would make it harder to plug it in backwards, I guess. Um, 
but it is definitely worth note taking or definitely worth taking note of the which way these plugs go in. Okay. Undo this plug as well. These are all keyed plugs. Very good. And that can flip over the back like that. That then allows these to come up and unhook out. They have a little hook on the end there. Lift this one up, swap out. Now we should be able to lift the cover off the batteries and remove the batteries. Now these are these are already nine amp hours. Well, that was a waste of time. Um, you know what? I'm in here anyway. Anyway, I'm going to swap these batteries out. I don't know how long this has been in storage. Um, we're going to put the other batteries in. Yep, we'll put the nine. These were already in here. We might as well change them over anyway. I was expecting to see like 7.2 amp hours in here. Um, so, a bit surprising. But maybe that's one of the changes to the new model. Right, we've got our screws back in. Time to start plugging things back in again. Um, this looks like this is the, the data line protection. Now, um, there's a couple of MOVs on there, but uh, I don't really think I like the idea of having my data lines anywhere near a board that can blow up the way this thing did, uh, or the previous one anyway. Um, so yeah, I don't think I'll be using that. Now, these are leads from the transformer. We'll tuck our positive wire out that side. Definitely going in the way with the keyed input. There's these two here. I noticed some slight differences with the transformer. We have zero volt on this end, 198 volt tapping, 230 and 267. I'm guessing this is switching between tappings to keep a constant output. The other one only had two tappings um, instead of three. At least that's off memory. And these are both 40 amp fuses on the battery input. Right, this is a terminal that's a little bit black from that little short out event. Give that a bit of a clean up. Um, hopefully they don't die. Now let's make absolutely sure we get the polarity right here. So this one is definitely the black, it's the negative. Okay. I may need to sandpaper that terminal to put this on. Oh, that is going to be slightly difficult. These are much firmer contacts. Give me a moment. Now this is where things start to get dangerous and uh, I can play the clip here of what happened last time. Okay. Which I think you probably saw at the start of the video. Okay, moment of truth. Negative. Positive. The bridge in the middle. Right. No sparkies. That's good. Alright, much firmer contacts than the other one too. This bridge wire is quite a bit thicker too. So are these um, secondary windings here. I think this is a little bit better than the last one. Now, I made a quick alteration. I've tucked this cable in under here. Probably not the route that I'd normally like to take it, but it is the ground wire. Um, but it was going to conflict with the case sides when we put them on. Um, this worries me though that this could be a potential short. Do we have a little bit of access there that's slightly better okay now something i just noticed here the tabs on these are actually a fair bit wider and a lot more robust than the batteries i've just put in there these might go back in there at some point in the future but for now i need it to work all right that's most of our stuff shut down the dvr's down computer's shut down we can turn this all off okay and modem has switched over to backup power and this thing seems to have tried to turn back on again all right it's finally off i think it's got a dicky switch in it all right let's pull it all out okay we are loosely installed usb lead is attached i'd like to leave a little air gap up the side there for cooling um there's chunks of wood underneath that cool we will climb down here and plug it in there's a shunt for a battery analyzer that goes into that. Um, I'm not sure what's going on there. 0 to 0 0.5 watts, I think, is what it's reading right now. 
That's because it's not plugged in. All right, moment of truth, we're gonna plug it in. Um, nothing yet. Oh, it's got a lower pitch beep. Let's come over here. We are now looking at about 70 watts. And peel that off. Now, hidden behind here is an RCD that I need to reset. I've just heard this click, which means we're back onto mains. That has been running on battery backup. This wasn't. Um, later on, this will. The NTD down there for the fiber connection that hasn't happened yet will have gone on the battery as well. We're going to wait for all of this to boot up and uh, we'll see how things go. All right, so now we're connected. Our voltage is a smidgen high here. I have seen this as high as 280 volts some days. Um, there's a lot of solar systems on this end of the network. I've seen it as low as 210 as well. Wild voltage fluctuations here, which leads to computer instability. This is exactly the same display as we had previously, so um, I guess I will keep the other one as spare parts in case anything happens to that. We are going to play around with the computer interface, see if I can find the software. And this one we will probably schedule it to do regular load tests so that the batteries don't end up just dying like they usually do. I've insulated these up, I will charge them from time to time and keep them happy uh, and topped up. Okay, we have a USB extension lead here. We've gone to a USB 3 one. Bit of a waste, but anyway, marked as a UPS because I often get confused with the rando cables that are plugged into stuff. I should have put this up the other way and then we would have been able to um, plug this in a bit more elegantly. But uh, this one wants to be a very thick, um, uncooperative cable. We're probably not going to have that like that all the time. But anyway, let's log in, get the software running, see what we can do. Now, some perspective here. Everything on my desk at the moment, including the computer, is only drawing about 350 watts. That is showing us at about 40% load. I do know when I run my laser printer and it warms up, it does exceed that just a little bit by about 110%. Um, so, yeah. But uh, let's get all this done. All right. So, on the JCAR website here, we found the software... We're going to download that, and um, it didn't come with a CD, but that's that's fine. I don't think most machines have CD drives anymore anyway. Okay, so the software is running, but this is a problem that they haven't fixed since the old version. You need to get this in focus and hit Alt-Space, then select Move and push the left arrow, and it'll bring it in off the side of the screen. That's one of the biggest problems I had with this software, as it likes to hide off to the side. I haven't had to do that since Windows XP. Okay, when this connected, it's uh, given itself an AX99100 PCI, which on my machine came up as COM port 2, because I have a serial card in that uh, occupies COM port 1. So normally, you would need to uh, go into here in the settings and set it as a single phase UPS. Um, and under COM port, and select your COM port there. Yours will probably be COM port 1, but uh, that looks pretty good. We have it setting up, it's showing it's doing its thing. That's pretty good, and it has communication phase from time to time. That's okay. It's group of battery 1. I think it's trying to check the second battery group, because I told it it had two batteries. I may need to change that in a minute. So I'm going through the software here, which is clearly very Chinesey. Um, but it says here, tip, can't alone set up time of startup UPS. Having a little bit of an understanding of how word order works with Chinese, um, it pro or Mandarin rather, this probably means that it can't work as standalone with startup time. So it probably means that uh, when you want to try and set a schedule like I'd like to, you need to have it plugged into the PC for it to run its scheduled thing. So for me, it may be easier if I just set myself a reminder in a calendar and unplug it from time to time and see what it does. But uh, also some of the changes in the way Windows 10 handles COM ports, this is a big problem. It just keeps going on and off and on and off. So the software is going to be good to check in on it from time to time. But for the most part, it's not going to really help me. Um, I have had to go back to Windows 7 on my workshop machine largely because of a lot of the serial and COM port stuff I'm doing. 
Windows 10 and Windows 11 just don't do it the same way. It's so hard to do this sort of stuff. But let's unplug it. Should show something different happening here. Definitely noisy, sounds very square wavy, but we are running off it at the moment. Battery showing at 56% on the front of the unit. Not showing much through USB at the moment. And 60% uh, load. Now I have to ha add an addendum here. I did find a more useful way of connecting to this. Um, I set it to mega USB and it found it, um, which is good. Now it's not dripping in and out. It's actually giving us correct information here. That's much better. So I think that's about all we can do for this. Um, yes, at some point I will put the original batteries back in because they are clearly higher rated current terminals on it. Uh, but uh, for now it's going to work. We've got nine amps. We've got a couple of spare batteries. I will test this periodically. So um, we'll let these batteries come up to charge. And that's about it. That was uh, a UPS changeover. I feel a bit more happy. And uh, I'm not going to lose my main workstation over Christmas, hopefully.